Hi folks, hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you and love to everybody out there. I'm just making a video with a heavy heart really. Um, I'm quite saddened and upset. And the reason why I'm saddened and upset is because it saddens me and upsets me that the Lord's people are not being equipped as they should be. And people need to be equipped, people need to be educated in sound doctrine. I talked about the, import, the, the dangers of dead orthodoxy and the dangers of, of that and the need to be in the spirit. But on the flip side, there's also the danger of people just not being sound and grounded in the word and grounded in sound teaching. And it really grieves me and it saddens me really. And the people would have lost a lot less problems if they were just grounded in, in, in sound teaching. So my website is jasonbirdspreacher.com and you can look at my Twitter and Facebook. And this is really a heart to heart talk really, this is a really heart to heart talk. And it's going to be specifically about again the inspiration of the Bible but we're going to tackle it from another perspective. We're going to just look at a few statements from B.B. Warfield and also the Westminster Confession of Faith. Okay, so that's where I'm coming from. But before I do that, I just want to share with you a few thoughts on a scholar called Bart Ehrman uh, on lost Christianities. And the reason why I want to share this is to show you not to be scared of these modern scholars that attack the Bible. Bart Ehrman is a top scholar in America, uh, trained under Bruce Metzer. Uh, written many scholarly works, has a massive reputation in the scholarly world, etc, etc. Written a book here, Lost Christianity, Bart Ehrman, 2005. I read a quarter of this book and I made meticulous notes. I'm not going to go into all the notes, but I'm just going to bring a couple of pointers out. Right, right at the beginning, he writes the book. He says, all this diversity and belief and practice... Um, and the intended and occasionally re result marks it difficult to know whether we shall think of Christianity as one thing or things, whether we speak of Christianity or Christianities, page one. Now, for the untrained eye, you won't realise the significance of what he's saying, but what he's saying is talking about the New Testament. But what he's saying is, there was no one so-called Christianity in the early church, so the fact that we have a New Testament doesn't mean that that was what the early church believed in. There were many, many Christianities, many, many ideas about canon. So, you shouldn't talk about one Christianity. Now, that sounds uh, okay from a postmodern perspective, but what he does very craftily in his book, he writes the word Christianity, Christianity, Christianity. So, in your mind, you're thinking there's one Christianity, but in, in actual fact, he's meaning many Christianities with the word Christianity. That's a very subtle, but very dangerous trick because you're indoctrinated without you knowing or realising it that there are many Christianities and there's never one Christianity because he equates orthodoxy with heresy. They're both Christianity. And, you, and if you use the word, if he uses the word Christianity, you unwittingly imbibe this double view that heresy and orthodoxy are the same. So his definition of Christianity is very nebulous. You don't realise that when you're reading the book and you subtly get indoctrinated without realising it. Uh, he says the Gospels that came to be included in the New Testament were written anonymously, anon anonymously page 3. One of the great scholars in, in the Gospels is a guy called uh, Hengel who's recently died, who says that we haven't got any manuscripts without the titles according to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So all the ancient Gospels that we have have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. That shows you pretty much that the tradition is that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So that he says that they were written anonymously, there's no evidence to, to suggest that. Okay? So again, bad scholarship. So we're seeing presuppositions, we're seeing bad factual information. And then I was shocked when, in a variety of chapters, um, 
He makes massive assumptions from very little data. He uses on page 7 the word proto-orthodoxy, again using language that he's invented, which indoctrinates you, which he doesn't give any evidence for. And um, makes very grandiose statements. He, he won't trust the New Testament, which is from the 1st century, but he'll trust documents that are from the 7th century that might indicate that they were in the 2nd century. So he won't trust the New Testament that comes from the 1st century, but he trusts the documents that he finds in the 7th century that are only fragments that possibly attest to 2nd century documents. And then comes up with all theories about community and how people thought about God in those times when it, it's just conjecture. So I did meticulous research on some of the statements that he made and found that his statements were empty and vacuous and lacked any credibility. So for example, I'll give you something meaty and specific to get your teeth into. On the chapter about uh, Serapion, the uh, Bishop of Antioch, there was a squabble, squabble uh, in Antioch by, with a bishop called uh, Serapion concerning the Gospel of Peter, this uh, pseudo-gospel. It's only about uh, three A4 pages long. Uh, and, and basically it's just a little bit about Jesus dying and rising and quite a bit about Pontius Pilate, this pseudo-gospel. Now Serapion, the bishop of Antioch, said it could be read. Uh, and, he, and he said this on the basis of... Um, on the, on the basis of... Um, there were, the church was generally orthodox and the people who wanted it to, to be read he thought were good people, so he said, okay, you can read it. But then he realised that the group that were pushing for this gospel to be read were heretics. So he found the gospel and he read it himself and he said, no, you're not to read it. So that's basically what Serapion, the Bishop of Antioch, is all about and the issue concerning the gospel of Peter. So... The main factual information about this you can find in Eusebius, the early church writer, father, writer of the 4th century. There's a little snippet of a letter by Serapion, the Bishop of Antioch. So I'm giving you something detailed, specific and meaty to show you how not to be scared of modern scholars. So from this basic information, we find um, that we have fragments uh, concerning the Gospel of Peter from the second century, very pragmatic bits, uh, possibly from Eusebius, possibly in Serapion's letter. It's only a very short letter. Um, I mean, when we say fragments, we say we're talking about a word or a couple of words, or even a sentence. So we find now. Um, some ancient documents of uh, an ancient document of one uh, of Gospel of Peter in the seventh century, and we also uncover um, some Gospel of Peter's um, that might be earlier from the um, rubbish dumps of, of Egypt somewhere uh, in Egypt. So in the investigation of this, Bart Ehrman basically says there were different types of Christianities because obviously this Gospel of Peter was very popular, more popular than the Gospel of Mark. So it must have meant that there was a Christianity that was as important as proto-Orthodox, i.e. what you and I believe. And so he gets this, he argues from the case that we have quite a few a handful of manuscripts from these rubbish dumps of Egypt date from the 7th century, maybe earlier to the 2nd century, possibly. And there's more fragments that we found in the rubbish dump in Egypt than we did of Mark. Therefore, conclusion, also the Serapian bishop said it could be read 
So it was obviously very popular in the ancient world. And there was other Christ another Christianity. You had proto-Orthodox, but now you've got this Gospel of Peter. It was very, very popular. Big early uh, church believed another type of Christianity. That's the argument. So, I'll show you not to be scared of these modern scholars. I did a bit of research, I did a bit of work. So, I went to look at the early church fathers, I looked at Origen, Irenaeus, this is on Mark chapter 1. Origen, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Vistorianus, Gospel of Nicodemus, Clement, Constitution of the Holy Apostles. These are ancient documents from the 2nd century. They all quote the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. Very snippets. What that shows you is right across the ancient world, the Gospel of Mark is being used. Secondly, an investigation into the document of the Gospel of Peter. I read it today. It's quite clear that that's borrowed from the Gospel of Mark and the other Gospels. Thirdly, an investigation into the information concerning Serapion and the Bishop of Antioch, looking at the actual letter itself, which I read, and also looking at a scholar called uh, Charles Hill, uh, an eminent scholar, Charles Hill, uh, who published the paper Serapion of Antioch, the Gospel of Peter, and of the four, Gos and a, a four Gospel canon, Charles Hill. Uh, in the studies in uh, Patristics, Oxford, 2007. He makes the point that these heretics were a, were a small group, that it wasn't widely accepted, the Gospel of Peter. That they were a small group, and it's clearly seen in the letter of Serapion, the Bishop of Antioch. So here's the point. We have an eminent scholar, massive scholar, brilliant scholar, writes these books, attacking the Bible, makes this statement, the Gospel of Peter, because there was more Gospels found in the rubbish dumps of Egypt, it was more popular, and because it was accepted in the time of Serapion, the Bishop of Antioch, it was obviously under the Christianity. Looking at the early church fathers, how they quoted. Also looking at Papyri 45, Chester Beatty, in the early New Testament manuscript. We have Matthew, Mark, and John, and Acts in that manuscript. Well, that shows you we know that Matthew was circulated all over the ancient world. We know that John was, we know the book of Acts was, and they're circulated with Mark, which shows you that Mark, obviously, was part of the circulation worldwide of text. Looking at Serapion, his letter, and the intricate argument of the time, of what the heretics were on about and what they were trying to do, we find that that claim that which Bart Ehrman says that the Gospel of Peter was more popular than the Gospel of Mark is a vacuous statement, lacking any real solid evidence of credibility. Now, I, that took me two, three hours of research to be able to debunk that claim of Bart Ehrman. But you as a reader would get his book and read it and just say, oh, well, if Bart Ehrman says it, it must be true. So don't be scared of modern scholars. You, you, just because they're modern scholars, just because the big PhDs and all the rest of it, doesn't mean to say they're right. You've got to do a bit of work yourself, investigate, and you'll find the correct information. When it comes to the canon, I'll recommend two books. The New Testament Documents by F.F. F. Bruce. Published by IVP. Excellent book. And The Heresy of Orthodoxy. Apollos. By I and uh, by Michael J. Kruger, Michael J. Kruger and Andreas J. Kostenberger. Uh, Andreas J. Kostenberger, Michael J. Kruger, and what is the heresy of orthodoxy? It's a really helpful book on the canon formation of canon. So I just. I, the reason why I've just done that for you is just to show you that a little bit of research, a little bit of thinking, and you don't have to be afraid of these modern scholars who've attacked the Bible like, like Bart Ehrman was just doing there in a particular area. So, 
just want to share with you just for a few minutes um, something on my heart really uh, let's go to the Westminster Confession on the scripture there is this view um, that says that what is important is the message <coughs> what is important is the message in the Bible not the words and this view <coughs> is, is is around today amongst evangelicals what's important is the message not the words of the bible <coughs> and the reason is because you might read your king james or any bible translation you might see a contradiction in it of numbers or there might be a problem with the manuscripts or something like we have 5,000 manuscripts and we can have a 99 point accuracy of bringing the textual text together but with there's one percent that we can't get in textual criticism so we can say, well, we're not going to argue about that. The message is important, not the words. And I've heard it said by one person, Christianity is not of the word. It is a message. It's about the message. The words are not as important as the message. Now, again, this is so important that you be grounded. It's so important that you know your, your teaching. You know what the word of God says. You, you ground it. Otherwise, you, you don't realise what you're saying. You don't realise what you're doing. Because that kind of teaching will let in liberalism. That kind of teaching has been in around for a few years and it brought in liberal theology, liberal teaching. And, and, and it grieves me that people don't, don't discern the error here. And it's because we're not grounded. We're not reading the great books that we should be reading. We, we're not reading the Puritans. We're not reading... The confession of faith, the confessions, we're not reading uh, good solid material. We're just taking on ideas and thinking that that's what it is rather than going back to the great, great books. Now I'm just reading the Westminster Confession. Although in the light of nature and the works of creation, the providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom and power of God. This is chapter one. As to leave them men excusable. Yet are they not sufficient to give that knowledge of God, of his will, which is necessary unto salvation? Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in divine manners, diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto this church, and afterwards for the bettering, preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same holy unto writing which is maketh the Holy Scripture to be most necessary, those former ways of God revealing his will unto the people being now ceased. Number two, under the name of Holy Scripture or the word of God written and now contained all the books of the Old and New Testament, all which are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. So all these books in the Old Testament and New Testament are given by inspiration of God. They are all inspired. The books commonly are called Apocrypha, not being of divine inspiration, are not part of the canon of Scripture, and therefore have no authority of the Church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than any of the human writing. The authority of Holy Scripture, for which it ought to be believed and obeyed, depended not upon the testimony of man or, 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 or Church, but only upon God, who in truth the author thereof and therefore it is to be received because it is the word of God. It doesn't say message of God or ideas of God, but the word of God. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture, and the heaviness of the matter, the efficiency of the doctrine, the majesty of style, the content, consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, Full discovery it makes of all the only way of man's salvation. Sorry I'm reading fast because it's getting late and I'm tired. The many other incomparable excellencies. And the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evident itself to be the word of God. It doesn't say the ideas of God or the message of God, but the word of God. Yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof, is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. It doesn't say ideas, doesn't say message, 
but it says words. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his glory, man's salvation, faith and life, is either expressly set down in scripture, or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge that the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word, and that there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and the government of the Church common to human action and societies which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rule of the word which are always to be observed. All things in scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike also clear. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and open in some places of scripture or other, that not only the learned but the unlearned in due course of the ordinary means may attain unto so sufficient understanding of them. The Old Testament in Hebrew, which was the native language of the people of God of old, and the New Testament in Greek, which at the time of the writing of it was most generally known to the nations, being immediately inspired by God, and by his singular care and providence, kept pure in all ages, are therefore authentical. So there's a brilliant statement. He's saying that the scriptures have been kept pure, and that they've been preserved. Isaiah 8.20, to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to the word, it is because there is no light in them. It is not according to the word, Isaiah 8.28. Acts 15.15, 15, and to this agree the words of the prophets, as is written. John chapter 5.39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. For you believe Moses, and you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Psalm 119, 106, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. So the Bible doesn't say the message is the main thing, the words are not important. It says, Psalm 119, 106, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the people. 2, Tim, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Isaiah 59, 21, as for me, this is my covenant with them, said the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, not ideas, not the message, but my words, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of thy mouth, for thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, says the Lord from henceforth forever. So the words are inspired. The word of God is inspired. And, and it, the Bible knows nothing of the teaching that it's the message that's important, not the words. Now I understand where the, the idea is coming from. What basically people like Muslims will argue about words, but they're missing the message. And, and what people are saying is, yeah, you're going on about the words, but let's get the message. What's the message? Jesus died. So I understand it's coming from that perspective. And there's a truth to that. We need to get to the message. It's not good getting down on semantics. It's missing the main point. Jesus died and rose again. You need to believe in him. And I understand that point. I understand also the point that uh, people have manuscripts and these manuscripts are not perfect and and we bring these manuscripts together and there are issues there. I understand also that uh, the apostles and Jesus translate words and just get the ideas rather than the exact word. Uh, and all these things are important and, 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 and helpful insights. But that's not the same as what the Bible teaches about itself concerning its inspiration. That's a different topic. The Bible itself teaches quite clearly that the message is encapsulated in the Word of God. And the Word of God is fully inspired. 
and there is no error in the word of God and, and the message is encapsulated in that word and is, and is protected and preserved within the word of God. And if you unwittingly say, well, it's not the word that's important, but the message, well, you've undermined the message because it's encapsulated in the word. So you've unwittingly cut your legs from under you without realising it. So you have to be very, very careful in your definition on why you're saying what you're saying. And without realising it, you'll, you'll let in liberalism in the back door without realising it in a few years time people will begin to depart from the faith and you just saw the scenes of that without realising it this is a, a book uh, we go to uh, an article God Inspired Scripture 229 by B.B. Warfield 229 So he goes into uh, the word inspiration in a very, 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 very scholarly way. Uh, so much material here. I'll just get... Uh, He goes that the words of scripture are conceived not only in Hebrew but throughout the New Testament as the utterance of the Holy Ghost is obvious enough and not to be denied. But it is equally obvious that the ground of this conception, conception is everywhere the aspiration of these words to the Holy Ghost as their responsible author. Litera, scripta, manet and remains what is as, as when written the words of the writer. The fact that all scripture is conceived as a body of oracle and approach with awe as the utterance of God certainly does not in the least suggest that these utterances may not be ascribed as God-given words or throw a preference for an interpretation of the Greek uh, can't read it which would transmute it into an assertion that they are rather God-given giving words the same may be said of the contextual argument naturally if I think it's author my friend will uh, castigate me now because he teaches, he's taught me a bit of Greek. Uh, I can't read it. It's Theos, the Stos, something like that. It means that God giving, it, it would, as an epitaph or predicate of Scripture, serve very well to lay a foundation for declaring this God given Scripture, also profitable. But an equal foundation for this declaration is laid by the description of it as God given. The passage just quoted from Origin will alone teach us this. All that can be said on this score for the new interpretation therefore is that it also could be made accordant with the context and as much and much more can be said for the old. We have the matter in this form since obviously a detailed interpretation of the whole passage cannot be entered into here but must be reserved for a later occasion. He goes on the results of our investigation would seem thus certainly to discredit the new interpretation offered by Ewald and Kremer. From all points of approach alike, we appear to be conducted to the conclusion that it is primarily expressive of the origin of Scripture, not of its nature, and much less of its effects. What is God breed produced by the creative breath of the Almighty? And Scripture is called. God breathed in order to designate it as God breathed, the product of divine spiritation, the creation of the Spirit, who is in all spheres of the divine activity, the executive of the Godhead. The traditional translation of the word of the Latin inspiratus a dio is no doubt also discredited if we are to take it as the foot of the letter. It does not express a breathing into the scriptures by God, but the ordinary conception attached to it. Whether among the fathers or the dogmaticians, it is general vindicated. What it affirms is that the scriptures owe their origin to an activity of God, the Holy Ghost, and are in the highest and truest sense his creation. It is on this foundation of divine origin that all the high attributes of scripture are built. So he's kind of arguing 
from 2 Timothy 3.16, if you turn to that, 2 Timothy uh, 3.16, it's basically a very, very uh, scholarly article on 2 3.16, 2, 2 Timothy 3.16. Is it? Yeah. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, what, what Warfield is doing in his article, you can go and read it. You can get these books, I think, PDF free. Revelation and Inspiration. But if you read this book, you'll get a classical understanding of the statement of what the Bible is inspired and, and this book is just full, it's crammed packed with scripture but it's a very very scholarly work a very very scholarly work and that article just goes into there's about 20-30 pages there just going into the one Greek word of what it means in, in that passage in 2 Timothy about all scripture is God breathed but all I just want to bring to your attention there is that in that article he talks about new views of scripture. That there are always these new views coming, trying to undermine the old view, the correct view. And, and this idea that the message is important but not the words is a new view. It's only been on the scene for like a hundred years. It's been popularised recently. and. Um, it's not the classical view of what the inspiration authority of the Bible is. And if you were to read this book by B.B. Warfield, it will give you the scholarly equipment to be able to discern these issues. And I would recommend you to read it. So I just want to finish by saying this. I... I I do my best, you know, I, I, I do my best in teaching the Bible. Um, I love the Word of God. I've read many, many books, philosophy books, all sorts of books, and there's no book better than the Bible. I'm very tenacious about defending the Word of God, and I'm very tenacious about defending the truth. Jude says, he says, earnestly contend for the faith and I've always tried to stand up for what the, the truth I've made mistakes in the past I've gone uh, in the wrong direction in, in um, you know backsliding in your Christian life and making mistakes uh, but my my heart my heart as a preacher is to be faithful to the truth and I don't want to preach my ideas I don't want to preach my opinions I don't want to hear people preach their ideas I don't want to hear people preach their opinions I want to teach the Bible and what the Bible says I want to stick to the old paths And, um, and it grieves me, it grieves me that the lost people, many of the lost people are not sticking to the old past, you're not getting grounded, uh, you're not grounding yourself in classical literature, you're not reading the Puritans, you're not reading the great Christian writers, um, you're not educating yourself and because you're not educating yourself these new ideas come in and you're getting taken down with them I'm not on about following men but you can like go to McDonald's and get a burnt cheeseburger or you could go to a salad bar and get a salad which one's going to do you the most good? A, a, a cheeseburger that's not of quality or a good salad and 
You can listen to low level Bible teachers that are just giving you stuff that's not helpful. You can feed yourself on hamburger theology. You can come up with your own hamburger theology. Or you can go to the great classics, the great theologians, the great books, the great Christian teachers like many of the Westminster Divines, many of the Puritans, like the Princeton theologians, B.B. Warfield and Hodge, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones and Spurgeon. You can go to these guys and be fed the finest of wheat and save yourself a lot of hassle. Save yourself a lot of a lot of hassle because you, you're getting good meat, you're getting good teaching, you're getting built up. Go to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones Recording Trust. Go to Sermon Audio. Go to Monogism. Go and read the classics. Any elder. If you're an elder, you should have at least read Herman Bavink's Reform Dogmatics once in your life. You should know the great confessions, the Reformed Baptist 1689 Baptist Confession, the Westminster Confession, the great creeds like Chalcedon and Nicaea. You should know these creeds. Um, you should be reading the great Christian works like John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress, Augustine's City of God, John Calvin's Institutes. You should be reading Fox's Book of Martyrs. You should be reading the Puritans like Thomas Watson. These are your heritage. And, and unless you have discernment and unless you're like really listening to good stuff and reading good stuff, you're just going to get in a mess. You're just always going to be in a mess. You're always going to be going down rabbit trails. You're always going to just be stumbling. And every week, every year, you're just going to stumble into a new era, a new teaching, a new problem. And you're always never going to learn but never learning. You're always never going to get anywhere. Because you're not grounded. And as leaders, as a pastor, and as an elder, you need to be, you need to up your game. You need to be always constantly studying the Bible. Always, always constantly reading good books. You should have a, a Puritan book that you're reading through the week. You should be reading good, solid Bible commentaries like the Banner of Truth commentaries or something like that. Or you should always be reading and studying good material. You should always be reading not only good material, but you should be reading material where you're educating yourself, where you can answer these, these critics of the Bible. And, and you should be aware of various theological movements of the time and how to counteract them and how to deal with them. And so when you're preaching and you're teaching the Bible and you're expounding the Bible, You've got a wealth of background knowledge so that you can guide the flock and teach the flock. And when you're preaching and you're preaching a sermon, you're aware of, of the movements in the world and movements in the church that are not right. And you can bring it in in preaching. You hide your scholarship. You don't reveal all your scholarship. You don't display it and, and, and show that you, you know everything. But you, you're to be discerning. You're to be understanding the times, the theological movements. But at the same time, you should be grounded in the Puritans, grounded in the Word of God, grounded in solid theology. At least reading good theology, like John Owen or something, reading uh, Thomas Watson or re reading some solid material that, that's building you up and teaching you and grounding you. If you're an elder, if you're a pastor, if you're a teacher. So, if you don't do that, then it's like, it's like getting in a car. And you get in the car, and you get in the car, you're drunk. You're totally drunk and you're blindfolded. You get in that car, you're just going to crash. 
If you don't have a love for the truth, a love for the word of God, a love for sound doctrine. If you don't love sound doctrine and if you don't love the truth, you're like a drunk who gets in a car and you're blindfolded. You're going to crash. You're going to, at some point, you're going to go into error. At some point, you're going to do damage to yourself and damage to other people. So I, I'm, I'm just saying, please, please pray that God will give you a hunger for the word. Pray that God would ground you, teach you by the Holy Spirit. Like I said, uh, it's not about dead orthodoxy. I'm not into dead orthodoxy. I'm into the, a life in the spirit, walking in the spirit. But it's not walking in the spirit without sound doctrine. It's walking in the spirit with sound doctrine. It's walking in the spirit with sound teaching. And, and it just grieves me so much. It just grieves me and it upsets me that people are not, are not hungry for the truth. They're not hungry for the word. They're not hungry to know the truth, to know what the word of God's saying. Um, it's all about Christ. It's all about him. But it's the Christ of the Bible and, and knowing the Bible and the teaching of the Bible, that's important. So I, I just hope this, I just hope that my passion for the truth, my passion for the word, my, my, my hunger for truth, my hunger for these great books and, and these great men of God who taught the word of God, my passion and boldness to stand for the truth, maybe it will inspire you to say, you know what, I'm going to be that way as well. If it just inspires you to be like that. You can be a man of the Spirit. You can be a man walking in the Spirit. A woman in the Spirit. You can be a woman in love with Jesus. But you, you, you're in love with Him. And, and you're walking in the Spirit. But you love the Word. You love the Word of God. You love sound doctrine and sound teaching. Please ground yourself in the word of God. Please hold on to sound doctrine. Please educate yourself in good Christian literature. Please. Okay, I'll pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you're good to us, Lord. We thank you that we do not believe error, but we believe truth. I thank you for all the blessings and all the liberty and all the joy that we have in you, Jesus Christ. And I just pray, Father God, that all those that have heard this video would be blessed and encouraged. And I just pray that they would catch the fire the need to hold on to sound doctrine, the need to hold on to truth, the need to hold on to the sound word of God. Hold on to the word of God. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us to follow you and to trust you and to, to hold on to the biblical truth, Lord. And the to the truth of thy word, thy sweet word, thy beautiful word, thy holy word, the word of God, beautiful and glorious in all its wonder. Oh Jesus, we thank you for your salvation and grace. We thank you for your wonderful blessings, your wonderful grace, your wonderful mercies. Bless, Lord, all those who heard these words, hear these words, bless them, Father. And help your people, Lord, to be discerned. In Jesus' name.
I just feel like crying because I just, I just think um, such a departure from the truth today, such a departure from the Word of God that's going on, and there's such a need for people to, to preach the Word and to, to, to expound the Word. Um, you know, we need to pray that God would raise up men who will preach the Word of God fearlessly in these dark days. Um, in fact, let's just read that. It's my favourite passage. This talk today is really... I'm just sharing my heart, really. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure the affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So, preach the word, friends. Excuse me. Hold on to the to the old paths. Hold on to the truth. And uh, I'm full of joy. I'm just I'm just sad. I'm full of joy, but at the same time I'm sad. I'm sad because it grieves me that so many people need to be grounded and uh, they're sheep without a shepherd and uh, it's sad. So I just pray that you would be hungry for the truth and for the word of God. Alright, God bless you.